So as we look at Acts 2 today, Dr. Luke is giving us a ringside seat to one of the three most pivotal, pivotal moments in human history. And I, I rank them this way. The coming of Jesus is one, the coming of his spirit is two, and the return of Christ will be the third. And that one's really going to change things. But, uh, but this is, th I mean, I don't know if you remember significant moments in your life. For example, I remember where I was when I heard Wayne Gretzky was traded from the Edmonton Oilers. Sharon and I were on our honeymoon walking in a mall in Calgary, and we walked by a store full of TVs, and that was what was on the TV. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Uh, this is more important than that. <laughs> Just for the record, even for a hockey fan, this is way more important than that. But, but key moments in time where you know everything about something that's important is, is changing, and it won't, won't be the same. It'll never be the same. God's prophetic promises have echoed uh, throughout the Scripture and through especially the Jewish culture for 1,500 years of human history. God had made promises. He had told the people about things. He had told about a nation. He had told about a king and a kingdom. And he had, he had prophesied these things, and they were sacred writings that the people cherished. But they had been waiting for a very, very long time. And now they were finally being fulfilled. Maybe you can remember a time in your life when you wanted something so badly. Maybe it's even now. But you felt like it was never going to come. It was never, ever going to happen. It was taking forever. And if you wait long enough, you'll begin sometimes to doubt the promise. You'll begin to doubt the promise. And your soul will tire of hoping and being disappointed. And it will become easier to just forget it and move on with life as if that thing won't happen. And if it happens, well, whatever, that's good too. I don't know if you've ever gotten to that point, but I have experienced that. And this, this was a weight that had been generations and centuries and millennia in the making. They had been waiting for a very long time. So consider the promises of God are yes and amen. We sang it this morning. You know, I was hoping we'd sing that song this morning. So my way of asking for that to be sung was just to say, Holy Spirit, it would be really great if we could sing that song this morning. And I left it at that. And what was the first song? I'm just going, God, you're just so cool, right? You're just so cool. Didn't even have to contact the worship team. Well, I don't, you know why I do that? It's because I don't want to interfere in what the Spirit wants to do. So I'm just offering him my suggestions. And apparently, you know, I got this one right, so that's good. <laughs> but, but when God does those things for us, then we know it's him who does it, right? That's when you know that that's God who is at work in you and through you, and he is inspiring you, and you're on the right path. And so, so the promises of God are yes and amen. It says that in, in uh, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. In Numbers 23... It reminds us of this, and you may recognize this also from our worship service this morning, that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? We talked about God being a promise, a, a, a promise-keeping, faithful God, and that's what that verse is about. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we had just talked about last week, and the manifestation of speaking in tongues had achieved an immense and important purpose. Huge crowds had now gathered around the, the, the people uh, of God and the upper room, and the manifestations that had happened there were not in secret. This was not just a secret, hidden little room where something amazing had happened. This was done in front of everybody. God made sure everybody knew what was going on. They had come to see what in the world was going on in Jerusalem and, and around the temple. And so the huge crowds had gathered, and the phenomena, uh, they were ready to hear an explanation for what they were witnessing because they were having trouble grasping it. Uh, God's people were now forced, forced to be front and center. As we think about what had just happened, the life of ministry of Jesus, his arrest, his crucifixion, Peter's denial, not even wanting to be known as one of them, and then all of the attacks that were coming from the religious people. Uh, they were securing the tomb and they were, 
They were going after these guys. They were scared. And, and so if, if, the, if you'd have been there and you were a little nervous and maybe didn't want to jump in front of a crowd of thousands of people to proclaim your allegiance to Jesus, uh, I, could, I could understand it. I'm not sure what I would have done. What would you have done? What would you have done in the face of another crowd that looked a lot like the mob that had Jesus crucified? And so this is a, 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 just a phenomenal moment and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're about to find out what the baptism of the Holy Spirit really means and what it really does. So consider who's about to speak. This is Peter. His training and education is fishing. Not really exactly, you know, a, a ivory tower of learning on spiritual things. He became uh, an itinerant follower of a guy that a lot of people were really quite divided about. Peter was, at this point, probably viewed by most as a marginalized rebel linked to a crucified wannabe Messiah. But the intentions and the promises of God are bigger than your past. How do you view yourselves? The intentions and promises of God for you, they're bigger than your past, just like it was bigger than Peter's past. And it's bigger than uh, public opinion about who we are or who we follow. And it's bigger than our skill set and our training or lack thereof. And it's certainly bigger than our standing in society because Peter didn't really have one. What did Peter have? About all Peter had <laughs> was a few years of walking with Jesus and learning to love him and be amazed by him to realize he was the real deal, his belief in Jesus, and now he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's about all he had to offer the world. It's no wonder we read later in the book of Acts, silver and gold have I none. But such, and maybe it would even be such little minuscule bit that I have, I will give to you. And that was the basis of his prayer. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit. The stage is set. The people are both curious and suspicious, and an explanation is definitely in order. Are they drunk, as some in the skeptical crowd are asking? <laughs> well, that's where we pick up our passage. So in your Bible, in your tablet, in your unit, whatever it is that you're reading, or from our screen, let's read Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. But Peter taking his stand with the 11, and the, the language here is a little deceptive. It almost implies, the original language almost implies that they pushed Peter to the front of the pack and made him talk. But he was sort of the elect. He was the leader. He was definitely a leader among them. And so with them standing behind him and pushing him out to do all the talking, he raises his voice and declares to them, men of Judea and all who are who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. Well, the first hour of the day is 6 a.m. in the morning, so this is 9 o'clock in the morning. We actually know when it's happening. And Peter actually is starting a little bit cheeky. He's kind of saying, it's only 9. We haven't had enough time to drink to get that drunk yet. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're pretty early in the day. That's that kind of, you know, whatever you're calling us, you think we're hammered. That usually doesn't happen until people have been drinking for a while. So he says, no, this is not what's going on. But then he gets real, real, real fast. And that's the first time I've ever been able to make a sentence with three of the same word in a row that actually makes sense. It got really real for everybody really quickly as he begins now to talk. Peter's message is divided into two clear sections for us. The first, he explains what is happening in verses 16 through 21 through the Scriptures. And then, from that point on, we hear the first inspired apostolic message from an apostolic leader under the anointing of the Spirit. And I think the content of what he feels is important to say, what the Spirit of God inspires him to say, is actually the very first creed of the church. This is what's really important. 
And so today we're going to focus on what Peter said to the crowd that day. Peter references the uh, prophet Joel. And in chapter 2, Joel 2 was a very important passage to the people of Israel. This was one of the things that as they lamented waiting for God, generation after generation and year after year and century after century, this was one of the promises that they held to. Because Joel 2 starts with kind of a serious warning. The judgment of God is coming on wicked people who reject him. But when he comes, he will renew his kingdom in this world. And there will be abundance and peace and prosperity for all of God's people. And so while it comes with a threat and a warning, it also is filled with hope that God is going to one day make this world better. Well, the children of Israel at this time are under Roman occupation, and it's not been much worse. (laughs) And uh, they've been through times as a nation. And this is one of those times where they have no freedom, and they are a very, very proud people. And they're proud not only for their own national sake, but they're proud because they are the people of God. And they know that the people of God, are, that God is supposed to be in control, that God is supposed to be the one who is worshipped and revered and, and, and loved and, and respected and honored, and he's not. The Romans don't give a care about their God or their religion. And so they're, they're zealous for themselves, but they're also zealous for God and his own reputation. And so Joel 2 is a very important passage. It's a very big deal to Jerusalem's masses. And essentially what Peter is about to say is what you have been waiting for, this day is here. This is what you're witnessing. So this is pretty dramatic, and this would definitely seize their attention. He launches into an argument, and essentially his argument is, what you have believed from the Old Testament prophecies, this is that. This is what you've read about and studied and waited for and anticipated for all these years. Can I ask you a question this morning? What is it that you long for, that you wait for, that you anticipate in your walk with God? Do you have a passion? Do you have a vision for what God, you want God to do? Do you have a vision for our city? Who has a vision for our city? Who has a a, a prayer that you pray over the people of this city, the people in your neighborhood, the people in your families, the people that you see when you're walking down the street? They're the people that you meet each day. Yes, that was Sesame Street. It's funny how these things go in and stay there. <laughs> because, because I worry sometimes that God's people, they're happy to be saved, but they don't really know what the kingdom of God is about. And they don't really have a passion for making an impact in the world for Christ. They're happy to be born again. But again, I'm curious, how is it you see yourself Do you see yourself as someone who can change somebody else's life? Do you see yourself as someone who can make a difference in the world? Because I think God does. There's a reason he called us salt and light. Joel 2 starts with that warning. There's darkness, there's gloom, there's destruction and judgment. It's going to come falling down, raining down on a wicked world, on those who reject God. But as we will hear from Peter, Joel reminds the people that it's never too late to repent, to turn to God, to get with the program of the Lord. And so just before before the verses that Peter is about to quote, most of his audience will have clung to a portion of Scripture like Joel 2, 23. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad. In the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. What is this scripture talking about? It's talking about, uh, it's actually an agricultural reference. And so how many of you grew up on farms? And there's, there's two really important times, right? After you put the crop in, you need moisture to help crops germinate. Or early in the year, you need moisture in the ground to help the trees and, and so on be, come to life. Because that initial life and health is what's going to help them to be fruitful. 
It's going to what, what be what helps them to, to actually go into reproduction mode. Anything that's just surviving won't reproduce. It'll use all its energy just to survive. And so, so you need the early rains. But once the crop begins to form and the heads begin to come, then you need another really good rain at the end. And that rain helps fill in the heads. I'm a grain farmer and we had beef. So, so that's what really helps the, the, the heads head out and, and have lots of seed in them and for them to fill out. And so if you're going to have bountiful crops... You need good early rains and then some, some sustaining rain, but then you need a really good late-in-the-season rain to help the crop be luscious. What this means to the children of Israel is actually bigger than crops. It's about prosperity. It's about provision. Do you remember when they were going into the promised land? They were looking for a land that flowed with milk and honey. Well, that isn't rivers of milk, ooh, or honey, goo. This is, it's about, it's about abundance and prosperity. It's about the good fruit of the land. And the children of Israel would recognize that good years and, and, the, and the fruitfulness of the land, the land was the Lord's. And this was the Lord's blessing on them and his provision. By the way, what else did we sing this morning? Jireh. That's short for Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord my provider. Right? And so this is entrenched in Jewish mindset. And, and so that's what they are thinking about out of the book of Joel. In verse 24, God promises abundance. And we remember what, what Jesus said when he, when he came. He said, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance or to the full or to a full measure. He's looking for us to experience the fullness of his joy. And he adds in verse 20, uh, seven, thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. What's this really all about? All this fruitfulness and prosperity and blessing and joy is that's what you get in the kingdom of God. That's what living in the presence of God is about. Not only in the natural things, but also joy and fullness and richness of life and soul. And so this is what this all means to them. The abundance God promised Peter says, that, that Joel was talking about, is this, that you are witnessing. This wind and this fire and these, all this worship of God, this praise of God, saying the great things God has done that you've heard all in your own languages, this supernatural outpouring, this supernatural explosion of worship. That's what you're experiencing right now. Verse 16, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God said. Now, that little addition there, in the last days, is not what Joel said. Joel said afterwards. But, but Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is now defining it. It's not just at a later time. It's this is the last days. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the beginning of the days of preparation for when Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom in this world. And so this is the final stage of preparation, so to speak. And it says, and he says, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. So what will be evidence in the last days? How will we know that God's at work? Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There'll be supernatural speech again. There'll be God speaking. You know, there hadn't been a prophetic word in, in, in Israel for over 400 years till Jesus showed up. It had been quiet for a very long time. And now, and now, all of these people are supernaturally speaking. They're speaking in tongues that they had not learned the praises of God. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I can't help but think, as Peter is preaching this, how fresh this would have been in the minds of people. Because, you know, it had only been seven weeks since Jesus' crucifixion. And do you remember what happened in the middle of Jesus' crucifixion? He's talking to the, to the uh, thieves, the, the criminals, one on each side. 
And he says to them, this day you will be with me in paradise. And what happens right as he says that? All the light drains from the sky. In the middle of the day, all the light disappears for three hours. And now here is Peter talking about a prophetic word that was uttered hundreds of years before that you will see these signs. What kind of signs? The signs like you've just seen in the life and ministry of Jesus. In case you had any question about who Jesus was, these are the signs that were prophesied, and these are the signs that have accompanied not only the, the, the darkness in the sky, but now the release of the prophetic gift. God is speaking again to the people. One of the challenges of being a prophet or a seer or studying their oracles, or studying words that the Spirit might give us even as a church, is that they can be a bit enigmatic. <laughs> they can be a bit confusing. We think we know. We know a little bit of what they mean, but there can be different interpretations. And so God will say something, and we'll be going, okay, what do we think that this actually means? How many of you have wrestled with a prophetic word and kind of thought, okay, I think I know what it means, and, and, and there's kind of different levels of, of the way it comes true, and... and in 2020 hindsight, it's much easier to understand how completely accurate the prophecy was. In our guessing, we're not so accurate. But when a prophecy is fulfilled, it becomes really obvious that that's what it was talking about. That's exactly what Peter is saying. This whole, all this stuff out of Joel that we weren't really sure what it all meant and how it would look, this is that. This is what was prophesied. God is faithful to do everything he says he's going to do. And now, when we look at what's going on in our world right in this moment, you can see exactly what God inspired Joel to write so that we would know and recognize it the moment it arrived. Peter is declaring this. Maybe we can pause for a moment as a modern-day church and learn something from this. In the Old Testament... The idea of, of supernatural flow or spiritual men and women was often the great prophet. You know, there would be a prophet in the nation of Israel, and they would travel to the prophet. They would, kings would go and seek out the prophet of God to, to hear or, or get a glimpse into what God would say uh, to them for guidance and for help. And so in the Old Testament, they would travel around the nation to go find an oasis of the Holy Spirit, usually which was residing on, on one, one man. So we think of Elijah or Isaiah, you know, these great prophets. And, uh, and people would travel to see them. So why is it then in our generation that we still operate sometimes in the same way? That we go traveling about the country looking for some place where the Spirit of God maybe has come and touched down. We go to Toronto. We go to Pensacola. And we go to find and hear and maybe get a little touch, the hem of the garment, or to borrow from whatever God is doing in that place, in that house with those people, and we go to get a little bit of that. Now, is that so bad? I think there's worse things than having a hunger for more of the Spirit. But I can't help but think it's a bit of an Old Testament paradigm that we go off looking for what God is doing by His Spirit out there. And I'm curious whether or not God opens these pockets and, and lets things happen not only because of the desire of the people in that place, for whatever reason, He's going to do something there. I, I'm curious whether it's actually to inspire us to say, like the words of the old hymn, what he's done for others, he can do for you, where you are. Because you see, the New Testament pattern wasn't that the Spirit would rest in pockets in these isolated little oases around the world, but rather, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and all of you, all your sons and all your daughters will dream dreams and have visions and speak prophetic words of life. So I'm curious, what's your mindset this morning? 
as we read the book of Acts, as we read the plan of God, the redemptive plan of God and how it's unfolding in the first generation of the church and the things God says is important, I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters and they will prophesy and they will see visions and I will show them things and I will speak to them. Is that what your expectation is for your life? How many of you have a little bit of a spiritual inferiority complex and you're not sure God would actually speak through you? So by the number of hands, am I to presume that all of you fully expect God to be speaking through you all the time? Okay, I don't know if you're not understanding the question, but you're not responding, so should we ask it again? How many of you actually do have some doubts about whether the Spirit of God would really move in supernatural dynamic ways through somebody like me? My hand is up. Sure we do. And, and I'm going to bring you back to the prayer we prayed at the beginning. What, are, what am I asking? What is God asking us to do? He's asking us to change our mindset about what is possible when he pours out his spirit on a Peter or a Glenn or a Sean or a Jen. Who are we to think that we're big enough to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit of God can do. Why don't we treat God more like he's really God? Since when did human beings ever become big enough or broken enough or whatever enough to actually cripple or handcuff God? Since when? There we go. Yeah. I don't see it in Scripture. You know, there's a very interesting verse in the Scriptures. It says, you have not because you ask not. And can I say this? We tend not to ask for things we really don't believe we will ever get. What's the point? So, here's the challenge of the Lord to us this morning. Can you reshape, can you allow God to reshape your perspective into an Acts 2 perspective? Because when God sent his spirit, it says that the spirit descended on all of them, on every one of them in that room. The spirit of God settled on them. And so if the spirit of God is in this house. Who is he speaking to this morning? All of us. And who can he speak through this morning? Any of us. All of us. Do you believe it? I know you know it's biblical, but I'm asking you if you believe it. I'm asking you if you expect it. I'm asking you if you're hungry for that, if you're asking for that. If you want that. My goodness. <laughs> These people were. <laughs> God has poured out his spirit. Just as Joel said he would. So what can we learn? Do I need to run around the country? No. The same spirit that moved in Toronto the same spirit that moved in the great awakenings, the same spirit that has rolled through whole nations of this world is the same spirit who's at work today. How many of you think Canada could use a fresh baptism and wave of the spirit? That wave is going to come through his church. God will pour out his spirit on all of his people and we will change our nation. That's God's redemptive plan for the world. 
I will pour out my spirit on all of you and you will be my witnesses, Jesus said, while Peter was doing just that. 1 Peter chapter 2, the same speaker who is preaching now at Pentecost reminds us as he writes the letter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You were not a people at one time, but now you are my people. You are the people of God. And therefore, I can flow through you if you'll let me, if you'll hunger for that. Do you know, even Moses longed for exactly what God was doing in this day. There were some who got a little jealous because for Moses because he was obviously Moses and he was the leader and, and somebody was prophesying and they got jealous and they were going to get him to stop. And Moses, this is what Moses' response was in Numbers 11. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Even Moses understood that that was what God would rather do. And now here we are in the book of Acts, and God's actually doing it. It's the beginning of it. And here you and I are this morning, living in the generation, in the days before Jesus' return, when that's exactly what he's willing to do, to pour out his spirit on all of us. So Peter is now about to proclaim to them this part two of this message. He says, first of all, in summary, he says, this is that which God foretold. What the infant church has just experienced is the outpouring of the spirit. And Jerusalem, you've borne witness to it. And then he says, therefore, these must be the last days. So get excited because God's doing things. And then he says, the proof is the supernatural manifestation of spiritual speech, Holy Spirit-inspired prophetic language and tongues. And then he says, this is the redemptive program of God on planet Earth. So he's kind of explained, okay, so now you know what this is. But now what does it mean? And now we're in part two. The second half of Peter's message is a sermon that points the crowds back to God's redemptive plan, which is all accomplished through Jesus. Surprise, surprise, the Holy Spirit is going to push people towards Jesus. Push them to the cross. Push them to repentance. Invite them. And so his outline for part two is essentially this. The age of fulfillment is here. It starts with the life, the ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus, just as all the prophets ordained and called the resurrection established Jesus as the Messiah, the king of a new people, a new Israel. Then he says the Holy Spirit is the ongoing extension of Jesus' ministry. What Jesus started, he will carry on through the helper, through the Holy Spirit in your lives and through us, through the body of Christ. And it will culminate in the return of Jesus as king and Lord. So let's read it as... And follow it as Peter leads the crowd to one inevitable conclusion. He says in verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. What does Peter start with here? He says Jesus' ministry was divinely powerful. This audience would have been in the crowds following Jesus around the countryside. They would have heard and seen the miracles. They would have met Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead. Remember, we were at his funeral, and then remember, next day we saw him in the market, and then next week we saw him in the temple, and remember how he was alive even though he was dead? Okay, that's a mind bender, right? But everybody, you could just go out and meet Lazarus. I wonder how many people came to visit Lazarus. Hey, I heard you were dead and you're alive. Really? What was that like? <laughs> I wonder if he ever got tired of telling the story. My guess is no. I'll bet it was pretty cool. And so here are the people. In fact, many of the healed, uh, many of the people who carried their families to Jesus, whose family life was changed because of a miracle Jesus had done, that's the people who had been in this crowd. The point was a foregone conclusion. They all knew it. They all knew what Jesus' ministry was, that it was definitely a visitation of God. And they don't even argue with him. At the end of his message, nobody argues that Jesus is clearly, clearly the Son of God, clearly the Messiah. This man, he says, in verse 23, was delivered over 
by predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Here's what I like about Peter. The guy who was scared to acknowledge that he was a disciple of Jesus is now tearing him a new one. <laughs> oh, by the way, when God sent his perfect plan, you through godless men crucified him. You guys all did that. Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to everybody who's listening. And Peter's touching on a really challenging paradox here, actually. If those of you who are philosophers or thinkers or theologians wrestle with this, divine purpose and destiny are established by prophecy from hundreds of years earlier. And we compare that against the decisions that people made to reject Jesus and then have him put on a cross. So did they have any choice? Is there really free will? You know, th this is an interesting paradox, but we can't divorce the things that God says and prophesies and speaks into the future from his foreknowledge. Him knowing what's going to happen is not him making the decision for us. And the bottom line is this, that what Peter is saying here is that this Jesus, who you all saw the supernatural evidence of his life, and you knew you were meeting God, you at some point made a decision, and you were accountable for the decision you made to reject Jesus as Lord. And you will bear the consequences of that choice. God may know what you're going to choose, but you're still going to make the choice. God's foreknowledge is a pretty cool thing. God had absolutely known all things. And what's Peter really saying here? Lest you think that God's whole plan hinged on what you as people were going to do, you can wipe that out of your mind. The divine plans and purposes of God are established from generations before, and when God says it, it's going to happen, period. Don't argue with it. Don't debate it. It's not about you. Having said that, you're also responsibility for what you do and how you participate in that. So he's being extremely clear. We are accountable to God. And I like the way he says this. Uh, you nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men. He's first of all saying, I know you had the Romans and Pilate do your dirty work, your mock trial with your hired false witnesses and the crowds that you stirred into a mob. But make no mistake, it was you who had it done. And God knows it and he's going to hold you accountable for it. Yeah, the Romans did it. The Romans nailed him, but you guys started it. Have you ever tried to get free of a sin in your life by quoting technicalities to God? <laughs> Have you ever tried to argue a technical argument? None of the charges that stand against us in the eyes of God are illegitimately placed. How many of you know you deserve punishment? <laughs> How many of you are tr good at trying to get out of it? It's okay to put your hand up. That's most of us. If I can avoid punishment, I will. <clears throat> Do it at home all the time. <laughs> the high priest, the Sanhedrin, the mobs. Who is he speaking to? Peter here is speaking to many people who also were the families that carried their sick up into the hills above the Sea of Galilee to have Jesus lay hands on them and pray for them. And then when they're out in the wilderness and they're all hungry, they ate the food that came from a supernatural provision from two loaves and some fishes. Those same people now, weeks later, are standing in the crowd. And they remember both being in the mob that cried out, let his blood be on us and our children, they remember doing that as well as they remember that their son or their daughter was healed. And so Peter is talking to people who have both experienced and seen things, but also failed, also failed to respond to God in that moment, to take a stand for what's right. Have you ever been a fickle follower of Jesus? Confession is good for the soul. I've told you before, but I'll remind you. One of the most invasive times I ever heard the voice of God, I was on a canoe trip, and it was a cold day. 
We were paddling into the wind. You remember that long lake, David, that cold, miserable, rainy day? It was like it had snowed. The snow came down just about to where we were, but not quite. And then it was just wet, like, ugh. And the wind was howling, and you're paddling in the middle of this lake, and we paddled for hours, and you'd look over and see the same stupid tree right there. <laughs> it's like, I've been paddling for two hours into the wind, and that tree's not moving. And we begin to despair. And I remember the day before, it had been warm and sunny. I was paddling with my shirt off, and I was praising the Lord. The water was clear. You could look down 20 feet in the water and see a fish. And I was worshiping the Lord, and here I was. And God said, just out of nowhere, well, you're a fair weather friend, aren't you? That was, that was just for me. Their, David's boat was way off somewhere else. They were fighting their own internal battles. <laughs> Have you ever had God call you a fair weather friend? Have you ever been one? God forgive us. Verse 24, but God raised him up again. You know, human beings act, and here's this human court, and they judge Jesus guilty, and Pilate feels he has control over the life of Jesus, so he sentences him to death. And the Roman soldiers, they beat the life out of him and tear his flesh from his bones and put him up on a cross, and then they put him in a tomb, and mankind thinks he's had the final word. And God says, nope, heavenly court of appeal. He was innocent. He doesn't stay dead. He's rising from the dead. You can't do that. I'm rescinding your judgment. You were wrong. Death cannot hold the Son of God in a tomb, no matter what human beings do. I love that God is sovereign and powerful. I love it when he overrules even me because it's always for my good. But God raised him again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. I love that verse. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. He is quoting here from Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is one of those psalms that was written, and the scholars kind of all debated about who this might be talking about. And some thought, well, it might be Abraham. Some thought it might be actually sort of symbolic of the law. And some, a, lot, a lot of them thought it was David, King David. Some thought maybe Hezekiah. But it's kind of all nebulous. And again, here's one of those prophecies. It's kind of obscure. But Peter says, no, none of those make sense. He goes on, brethren, may I confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. In fact, he could have said, if you just go a little south of the city, there's a little town called Siloam and, and there you all know because many of you have visited the tomb of the great King David. And guess what? It's still sealed and his body did see decay and so it's clearly not David. That's what he's actually quoting here. But he says, think about what just happened with Jesus. It's really clear that this psalm that you never understood the prophetic interpretation of, this psalm is actually talking about Jesus. That this all begins and ends. This is all about Jesus. And so he's making the case for Christ. And he says, I'm confidently saying to you. And so because he was a prophet and knew God had sworn to him with an oath. And by the way, this is another quote from the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 110, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. He said, it's not David, it's his son. <laughs> the promised son of David that would sit on the throne. One of the names of Jesus was the son of David. They called him the son of David. He was in the lineage of David. You remember from Luke 2? Why did he go? Where did he go to, for the census? Because he was of the... House and lineage of David. Here was an actual descendant of David. And this is the fulfillment of God's promise to David that his son would sit on the throne. And not just the throne of Israel, but the throne of the kingdom of God. Peter has once again appealed to the prophetic word of Scripture to make his point. Some thought, oh, I told you about that. Let me just skip this part.
Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. So you had him crucified. It wasn't David. Jesus rose from the dead. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended to heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Where is Jesus now? He's risen from the grave, and he's got bigger things to do than just be the king of this little nation. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God over all of creation. That's where he is. We learn now that Jesus is, ever lives to make intercession for his people until his return. Jesus is talking to the Father about you. He's talking to the Father about you and what you need and what's going on in your life. Isn't it cool that Jesus and his heavenly Father... They have a, uh, the Holy Spirit in us, and they're talking about your life all the time. <laughs> How many are the thoughts of God towards us? So many, more than the very hairs on your head. So a little bit about me, a lot about joy, <laughs> right? God speaking, God in this exalted place. The name which is above every name. So these folks had seen and heard. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you have crucified. And so Peter has stood up and said all the things that he'd never been able to say. What did I ask you earlier? What can God, what does this baptism of the Holy Spirit thing really do? It turns Peter a coward fisherman into a prophetic powerhouse who challenges the whole city of Jerusalem from the very heart of their place of worship at the temple with the fact that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> he is risen. And he says, just like in Joel, there is judgment coming on you for crucifying him, but there's still hope for you. There's still hope for you. What did Jesus say the baptism would turn us into? You shall be my... What did the baptism of the Spirit make Peter? A profound and powerful witness to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is King and Lord and who is coming back. Peter's driven the message home. I don't know if you're used to this kind of language. I don't know if we're used to this kind of sermon anymore. I'm going to dip into Steve's message. What did they do when they heard it? Well, I'm going to borrow, borrow the beginning of Steve's text for next, next sermon. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Can I offer you today that that's the same question that God is asking you and I today? Knowing this, knowing God's plan, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with his invitation to live a life which is empowered by his spirit? What are you going to do with the fact that he's called you to be salt and light in this world, to have and live a supernatural life? Dare you speak for God? Will you? I pray that you cannot walk away from this message, that you can't dismiss it. That if you are not fully surrendered to Jesus as Lord of your life this morning, I pray that he makes you miserable until you do. But only because he loves you. Isn't that like family? They love us enough to make us miserable? I pray that if you think you're disqualified by sin, I pray that Peter's story debunks the lie of Satan that has filled your heart and caused you to believe that God can't use you. I pray that God doesn't let the world and its pleasures 
or its philosophies or its distractions make you numb to the hope and the promise of God to make you a new creation, to make you a prophet of priests, a royal priesthood, a nation of prophetic people. I hope that you are not oblivious to the fact that Jesus is coming soon and the judgment of God against sin is going to happen, but you don't need to face it because Jesus has cleansed us. His blood has paid the price so that we can walk in newness of life. More than anything, I pray that you come to know that the purpose behind all of this is that God will save your life and give you a life eternal and abundant because of how much he loves you. And he's gone to supernatural lengths to make it happen. Can you bow your head and close your eyes? Lord, I thank you this morning. I want to thank you this morning that Jesus, what you came and started, what you did, what no man could do, what no person could do, Jesus, you accomplished on the cross. You are the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Lord, we need to come to the place where we repent of our sin. And this morning, Lord, I, I don't know if there may be someone here today who has never installed and invited Jesus to be the Lord of their lives, to surrender their gifts, their talents, their future, their heart to you, to be a follower and a disciple of Christ. But if you are here this morning and you've never made that commitment, I want to give you that chance now. And so with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you've not done that, but you understand what's at stake here, Jesus is calling you. He's saying, I want to give you the abundance. I want to bless you. I want you to know me and I want to know you. If that's you, just raise your hand and make eye contact with me just for a moment, just so I can see. You know, we can do these things in our hearts. We can do these things in our hearts. But sometimes we walk out and it's like we didn't really do anything and nobody really saw and we can kind of back out of it. The reason I ask you to make a public acknowledgement, even just with me, is so that you remember something real is happening here.